Now on BBC Two, Emily Maitlis with Newsnight. I won't be working for the BBC anymore because I think it's best for the BBC, best for the people that have been offended. Russell Brand steps down after 27,000 complaints. The work of mob rule or the licence payers' right? Tonight, the stratospheric rise of a media furore. Ross and Brand both apologise. Now Brand has gone. Is this what the audience wanted? We'll be debating if the BBC can afford to lose the very generation that Brand attracts. Also tonight, war and refugees in the Congo will one of the most violent conflicts of the 20th century now haunt the 21st. Can we spend our way back to prosperity? The government rewrites the fiscal rules to fend off a slump and the hidden environmental threat posed by the online revolution. This is the back end of the internet, rack upon rack of computers called servers. They don't call these places server farms for nothing, they're huge. Hello, good evening. His show was originally described as must-listen radio, but today the number of those who beg to differ reached a mind-boggling 27,000. That, at least, is the number of complaints to the BBC concerning one ill-judged comedy stunt on Radio 2 by big-name stars Russell Brand and Jonathan Ross. Tonight, they've made public apologies, and one of those, Brand, has resigned. What does the meteoric rise of this furore say about the BBC and what signal does Brand's going send out to younger viewers the BBC is so desperate to attract? And if, as reports suggest, Jonathan Ross is suspended, but still on £16,000 a day of taxpayers' money, perhaps the joke's on us. We'll be debating all that with comedians and others a little later. First, this report by our culture correspondent, Steve Smith. This is the set of Jonathan Ross's popular Friday night chat show on BBC One, or at least it's most of the set. It already looks partly disassembled. Since the news emerged today that the star was being suspended and the show wouldn't be recorded tonight as usual. <laughs> While Ross's future is in doubt, comedian Russell Brand, his collaborator in the prank phone calls to actor Andrew Sachs, announced tonight that he was resigning from his show on Radio 2. I now um, acknowledge it was a really, really stupid thing to do, particularly because Andrew Sachs is an actor and comic performer that I very much admire. Also, for me, I only do that radio show because I want to make people laugh and make people happy, and obviously it's gone beyond the point where I do that. Obviously I'm making people unhappy and angry and sad. So I'd like to not do that radio show anymore. I'd like to apologise for these terrible yeah, attacks, bum. Andrew Sachs. Bum, bum, bum. It's now almost two weeks since Brand and Ross taped the offending calls, which included off-colour references to Andrew Sachs' granddaughter. The show is now under investigation by Ofcom and by the BBC itself after the phone calls were allowed to air. The butt of the DJ's remarks has welcomed developments. I'm thrilled because justice has been done. And, um, yeah, let's, let's see what Ofcom choose to do about it. Um, I don't know how it's going to go from here, but I'm really happy with um, the investigation. It's hard to believe now, but the controversial broadcast attracted just two complaints from listeners. But the story's been in the news since the weekend, and by tonight, more than 27,000 comments had been posted to the BBC's Have Your Say website. The Director General of the BBC said today, I'd like to add my own personal and unreserved apology to Andrew Sachs, his family and to licence fee payers for the completely unacceptable broadcast on BBC Radio 2. Mr Thompson added, it's clear from the views expressed by the public that this broadcast has caused severe offence, and I share that view. In common with other media outlets, the BBC, it seems, is always urging its audience to get in touch. And there's no need for green ink these days, when complaining is just a few strokes of the keyboard away. Some will welcome this as a democratisation of the ether, but venting your spleen has never been so easy. Very well, thank you. 
but mention the two stars to younger viewers and there aren't howls of outrage. Excuse me, anyone here for Jonathan Ross? Oh. Phone-in shows and message boards suggest there may be a generation gap in reaction to the controversy. I think the BBC has to be very careful not to paint itself into a corner of becoming so respectable, so never offending anyone that uh, they don't appeal to anybody under a certain age or of a certain social group or whatever. And I think that would be an unfortunate route for it to take. Losing Russell Brand, you know, he didn't start here. He started MTV and then Channel 4 and they built him up and then the BBC kind of went, oh, he seems good, let's get him in. And he was a big name for them and that's a sensible thing to have done. But they have other youthful presenters and they can keep pursuing that. It would be disappointing if they became so terrified of upsetting or offending people who don't even listen to that show that they just overreacted. <laughs> Brand's tabloid notoriety was played up when he was a guest on Ross's chat show, and the host's tendency to use bad language is reflected in the title of his new book, Why Do I Say These Things? Today, though, he was contrite. I'm deeply sorry and greatly regret the upset and distress that my juvenile and thoughtless remarks on the Russell Brand show have caused. I've not issued a statement previously because it was my intention and desire to offer an apology to all those offended on my Friday night programme. However, it was a stupid error of judgment on my part, and I offer a full apology. Yeah. Oh, no. And no. what of the man who received the unwelcome calls in the first place? Had he decided on taking things further? I have decided. I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't need to decide. I'm not going to take it anywhere. I'm not out for revenge or anything like that. These two performers, I'm a performer, and sometimes it goes very wrong, and it's up to them to do better. That's enough, isn't it? Many will concur, not least Brand and Ross and their bosses at the BBC, but it's not over yet. The corporation's internal inquiry is nearing completion and further action may follow. Stephen Smith there. Well, I'm joined now by Jen Ravens from Dead Ringers and the writer and broadcaster John O'Farrell, one of the writers for Spitting Image and founder of Britain's leading satirical website, New Biscuit, and the stand-up comedian Stephen K. Amos. Welcome to you all. Thanks for coming in. Uh, John O'Farrell, just uh, step back. Take us through what we've seen this week, what you think we've seen this week. Two complaints soared as of tonight to some 27 thousand and now resignation well we've seen a mob rule take over the airwaves really uh, this is tabloid created it's an artificial and uh, contrived scandal and uh, they've chased out two great well, one great talent we've lost russell brand off uh, radio 2 which is a great shame uh, and there's a program that's not going to go out on friday night with guest books and everything which would have been a great opportunity for jonathan ross to say sorry in his own way in a witty and i think quite creative way and so i'm sad that he hasn't been given that opportunity i, I mean you, you call it um mob rule but actually what this is about surely jan ravens is allowing the audience to tell us what they always think what what we're always saying have your say and they have done i guess well yes i think it's a shame to give the kind of daily mail battalions a kind of weapons to kind of beat the bbc with because you know some of the best most of the best programs in the world get made by this organization and i'm really cross with russell brand and jonathan ross who i think are both brilliant and a lot of russell brand's work it's sweet it's verbal but you know that it this the particularities of this case i mean i do find what they did offensive and i do think they have to kind of make some kind of reparation for it although i would you know i would defend you know free speech and experimentation in comedy of course you've got to have that and i really hope that we don't have a kind of close down on anything that might be a little bit risky that would be awful uh, stephen kermos do, do you think that could happen i mean this is just one isolated incident mm. that i'm sure some would say has been blown way out of proportion. Will anything fundamentally change in the way comedy's done here? Well, I, I personally think it will do, because I, like Jan, I'm absolutely all for freedom of speech and expression, and what, the fact of the matter is this, this, uh, this actual show went out a week, more than a week ago, and they had maybe three or four complaints, but the Daily Mail and people like that took it on board, 
blew it all way out of proportion. And now, we see, I did a show last week for the BBC and I had to fill out a compliance form where, you know, I had to kind of make sure what I was saying was accurate. And so you kind of, you're losing your, you're, you're funny, you know, yeah. you're losing the mojo. That's, that's what we're all here to, to express ourselves in a creative way. I'd hate to the day that the BBC has to come down hard on any performing talent and say, look, this is what you can say, this is what you can't say. What? Don't you think that there, there should have been someone during, uh, that, uh, you know, at some stage, somebody didn't go, because uh, they were sort of saying, oh, Oh, uh, I think we might be a bit upsetting here. Maybe he's going to commit. I mean, they sort of compounded it, I think but they did yeah, seem but, aware mm. that it was going to be offensive. And then apparently Andrew Sachs said, "Please don't put it out." And, I mean, I mean, you have worked within the restrictions of the BBC. Yeah. You know that you go f for consent forms for, for release forms, as it were. Well, yes, when you're doing hidden camera or prank phone call stuff, you generally are. You know, generally what you're playing on is the discomfiture of your subject and, the, and their sort of reaction and bafflement. And then you have to ask their permission after you've done it to uh, to broadcast the stuff. So uh, so although they might be sort of a bit baffled at the time, they're kind of at the end. They're all like, oh, it's such a you. It was you really? Uh, yeah, and I don't think anyone is saying that this was a good piece of broadcasting that but Jonathan Ross and Russell Brand. No, it wasn't funny. It wasn't but funny. the point about those two broadcasters is that they sail very close to the wind, and that's why they're very compelling to watch and entertaining. They went the wrong way, of the, went over the line, and we all agree that was a mistake. They agree it was a mistake. But two people complained on the day. Absolutely. And now the BBC has cravenly caved in and suspended the show. Russell Brand has walked, and uh, it's it's com completely mad that uh, we've lost these. Uh, but yeah, two but we're all actually saying this isn't funny. It was in bad taste. Mm. It was incredibly offensive. Does it actually matter that one of them's gone? Yeah, it does matter because they're big talents and we want to have good people on the BBC. We don't want to have that stuff. Uh, I say this as an, as an editor of a, a comedy website, but we don't want all the good comedy to go onto the, onto the internet like you get on Onion News now. You want the good, edgy comedy and on the BBC. And you think that's what will happen You think that the BBC what, what goes more mainstream as a result of this? No, what, what disturbs me is, is, that, is that people sort of say, well, we've got to have, you know, Russell Brand and Jonathan Russell to attract the young viewers. Mm. But I think, I mean, I do think there is a danger in a lot of comedy of this kind of misogynistic cruel comedy creeping into a lot of male broadcasters work you know uh, um, uh, and it's it's a trend that seems to be getting more and more extreme and I think there does seem to be a sort of wake-up call about that there does need to be a wake-up I think that's a really good point there but what actually worries me more is that this was a pre-recorded show yeah mm. so there was actually room for them to kind of actually yeah. let's not put what, this bit in. I, I wonder if that's to do with the power do? of the stars as well they're such big stars yeah, that the nobody producers are no longer the editors the, are the they? producers weren't confident enough to go actually guys mm. we're I'm, not putting that out whatever you think I'm just curious what does this do to the the whole uh, generational gearing of the BBC mm. if we think that people People like Russell Brand uh, were brought in. They weren't brought in to be safe. Presumably, no, no, they were no. brought in we can have yeah. to get the younger audiences exactly. going. We can have bland mediocrity if we want, but if it was great, on the BBC website today, they had the queue of people waiting to see Alan Titchmarsh, who were all completely shocked about this, and the queue of people waiting to see Buzzcocks, who all thought it was a big fuss well, about Well, it's interesting. Nothing. I mean, today, Radio 1, uh, quite an interesting blog there, by six to one, their listeners were saying, what's the problem? This mm. is out of proportion. Is there a danger that you lose any of that, as it were, the next generation of license fee payers? What if, 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 if Russell Brand goes, you mean? If this is what they think is the response to the people that they have been attracted mm. towards in the first place. Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, it, it would be a mistake to lose all these broadcasters, but, you know, these broadcasters do have to... You know, maybe there's there's different ways of being creative and attractive, attracting young audiences than making cruel jokes about you know shagging people's granddaughters. I think you're right. I think the the, the, the key here is the diversity of the talents that are out there, and I think we shouldn't be we shouldn't respond to this kind of knee jerk reaction by kind no. of going, oh, 27,000 people have, played, have complained who didn't even hear the thing in the yeah, first yeah. place, yeah. who've all jumped on the bandwagon because there is room for different kinds of comedy. I'm not justifying the or, 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 or applauding what they did because mm. I too find it quite in, yeah. in poor taste. And yet there will be people sitting out there saying it's all very well, comedians in the sort of media world talking about this, but actually fundamentally the BBC is not setting an example of how we want uh, our children to behave and these are role models, they're getting paid extraordinary amounts of money and we don't care if they go because actually we're not going to miss them.
I, well, I, I, I don't know about that. I think that uh, the BBC, because it's uh, uh, funded by the taxpayer, by, through the licence fees, etc., they feel the need to reflect what's happened. But, yeah. And when you get a level of 27,000 plus complaints, they have to respond in some kind of way to be seen as doing the right job. But I guarantee, I, I think, we all know Russell, his, his, his image is this Lothario, and, da, 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 and it has kind of played up to that. But maybe what's happened now is it's actually turned around and bitten him on the behind. What's sad is that the, the artists will self-censor themselves. And you want the producers to do that. This is a pre-recorded show. It's the middle management here who have actually cocked up. Uh, if only they had done their job properly, then we wouldn't have uh, uh, artists does, does now this, sort of Does uh, this go to the core of, of a much bigger debate about what the BBC is about? Uh, if, if, who it's trying to the attract BBC and whether it, it can keep those people? The BBC shouldn't let that debate. They should have had their confidence to say, well, we're going to have an internal investigation and we'll stick with it. The mail can go, oh, abolish the licence fee. But we, we don't want to get down that whole road. The BBC should have a bit more self-confidence, I think. I, I, I think to agree with you as well. I think the BBC should uh, stand by their, their guns and also, also but also reflect um, the, the mood of the nation because if they just ignored this, in this, the, when we would be, heads would be rolling for, for the next month and it would be still in the press for, for, for time to come. But I, th I think what they've done is they've taken some decisive action, it may not be the right course of action, but something had to be done. Okay, thank you all very much indeed. Thanks for coming in. If Rwanda was the last dark genocide of the 20th century, it was the one many swore they'd never let happen again. Today, Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General, warned the situation in the neighbouring Democratic Republic of Congo was creating a humanitarian crisis of catastrophic dimensions, threatening dire consequences on a regional scale. Thousands have been fleeing the violence of Congolese rebels and heading towards Goma as refugees. The UN Secretary Council, Security Council are meeting now to discuss the situation. And tonight, Gordon Brown pledged to ensure UN peacekeepers were properly supported as the country waited to see if the ceasefire declared by the rebels would actually end the fighting. And Little, who's reported from the region since the war began in the 90s, looks back at how this conflict developed. The rebels who are now closing in on Goma didn't spring from nowhere. They've been fighting this fight on and off for the last 14 years, ever since the genocide in Rwanda in 1994. They come from the ethnic Tutsi minority in eastern Congo, and they've never really been convinced that the genocide is over. They've never really felt safe. They say they're still surrounded by neighbours who took part in that genocide and who then fled into the forests and hills of eastern Congo, taking their genocidal intent, their genocidal campaign, with them. The region is no stranger to humanitarian disaster. It knows what happens when whole populations flee on foot into the countryside without food or water. The most vulnerable, children especially, start to die very quickly. I saw it for myself in 1994, when 900 people a day were dying from dehydration, dysentery and waterborne diseases. That's why what happened today is of such concern. Tens of thousands of panicked civilians fled their villages and poured into Goma, a city barely capable of feeding itself. And if the rebels look like taking Goma, they and tens of thousands more will pour out again, heading for the hills and forests. And that is where the humanitarian disaster lurks. The atmosphere in Goma, from what we've been hearing from people on the ground, is that they're frightened. They don't know what is happening. They don't know whether they're going to be safe this evening. Um, they don't have information about what is going on. And there are many gunshots uh, that are being heard even though the rebels may not advance onto Goma this evening, what may happen, of course, is that Congolese government soldiers take advantage of the situation and start to loot and pillage from the local population. So what is the war all about? It may have started as an attempt to make the Tutsis safe from genocide, but it very quickly became a smash and grab, a war for resources. Congo has immense mineral wealth, so the neighbouring countries started weighing in, each one supporting its own favoured minorities, sponsoring its own client militias. Tiny Rwanda has twice invaded Congo and overrun a country nearly 40 times its own size, ostensibly to defend the Tutsi minority. And at the height of the war, Zimbabwe, Angola and Uganda all had troops there. They were engaged in a new scramble for Africa, a scramble for the mineral wealth of the Congo Basin, and a war that has killed more than five million people. It's become a war of, of resources in that it's the resources, cassarite, which is tin, gold, diamonds a little further west, um, and, and other minerals. But essentially, it's a, it is a political war, and it begins 
and is still about the Rwandan genocide, which has been simply uh, moved out of Rwanda into Eastern Congo. But because everybody is able to grab a bit of, um, a, a bit of the mineral resources there, they're able to keep fighting and there doesn't look like there's any sort of peace agreement uh, on the horizon. The United Nations and the aid agencies in Congo have struggled for years with the moral compromises of their involvement here. In the 1990s, international aid fed the refugee camps, knowing full well that among the displaced were the very men who had carried out the genocide in Rwanda. That infuriated the Rwandans, who claimed that these UN-supported camps were being used as bases for repeated attacks back into Rwanda and for the continuation of the campaign of genocide. But without international engagement, however compromised, there is the ever-present menace of further suffering. We all have those ghosts in the back of our mind of the tragedy of Rwanda or of the invasion of UN compounds in East Timor. And I think there are many of us who really are committed to the principle of never again, which is why uh, we're now reacting so strongly to this and pushing for steps to stop this before it escalates to anything like that level. So where does it all leave the United Nations? They have 17,000 peacekeepers there, the biggest peacekeeping force anywhere in the world. And suddenly, there's no peace to keep. They find themselves instead war fighting, trying to hold back a rebel advance on Goma and finding that they're not really up to the task. There's a further acute moral dilemma, which chimes with that that the aid agencies were in in the 1990s. And it's this. They're committed to supporting and defending the Congolese army. The Congolese army is also supported by the remnants of the Hutu militias, the guilty men of the genocide in 1994. The UN therefore finds itself in an unholy, unwanted, but de facto alliance, not with the survivors of the genocide, but with its original perpetrators. The word chaos hardly seems adequate. Alan Little there. Well, a short while ago, I spoke to Kevin Kennedy from the UN Department of Peacekeeping. I began by asking him what was going to happen in the emergency Security Council meeting he was about to go into. Well, the, the Security Council obviously is extremely concerned about the situation in the Eastern Congo. Uh, we'll be going into the Council to explain to them what's happened in the last 24 hours and the attempts that are being made by the UN peacekeeping mission in the Congo, MONUC, uh, to try and improve the situation and uh, to protect the civilians. We understand that the head of the UN mission in uh, DRC uh, was asking for more troops over a month ago, that the Congolese ambassador uh, asked for a Security Council emergency meeting. Why hasn't this happened before now? The, the Council has obviously been seized of the, count of, uh, the situation in the Congo for a, for a long time. Um, yes, at about uh, October 3rd, Alan Doss briefed the Security Council and presented uh, a number of, of requests uh, for additional troops and for additional capacities for MONUC uh, to be able to support the peace process in the country, two processes that are essential to try and, uh, and stabilize the situation in the Kivus. Uh, the Council still has not acted. We have made the case to them. Uh, and we hope that, uh, that the Council will, will, will uh, give us a better hearing this evening. You've got 17,000 troops there. How many do you think you realistically need? Well, I think it's not just a question of numbers. It's a question of the kinds of troops and it's a question of the mobility they have and the assets that they have. Let's bear in mind that you talk about 17,000 troops uh, in a country the size of the Congo, which is roughly uh, equivalent to uh, the United States east of the Mississippi River or most of Western Europe. Uh, a, uh, a force of 17,000 troops uh, is really not very large. We have some 92% of our troops located in the two provinces of the Kivus. Um, these are provinces that are uh, larger than uh, the Benelux countries. So it's not a question of numbers. It is a question of capacity, and it's an is it is a question of uh, having the, the kinds of support necessary uh, to carry out the mandate. Yeah. I, I, guess, I guess the real question, though, is when you're talking, as we are now, about Tutsis and Hutus at each other's throats, don't alarm bells start ringing? We've been here before with Rwanda. The, the UN simply can't afford to get this wrong again. Well, I think the, the fact is that it's, it, 
the international community cannot afford to get it wrong, uh, and that uh, it's critically important that the two countries most affected by this, that is to say, the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Rwanda, uh, work together on addressing the situation in the region. Um, the underlying problems have yet to be addressed. Uh, it has been 14 years uh, since the Rwandan genocide, and we are still dealing with the residual effects of that problem. Kevin Kennedy there. The Chancellor, Alistair Darling, confirmed tonight what many had already taken as a given. Those fiscal rules have been torn up to allow the government to borrow heavily and spend its way out of a recession. At least that's the plan. Today he insisted the government needed flexibility but would return to the rules once the shocks had worked through. Many, including leading economics and advisers and the shadow Chancellor George Osborne, fear it's a gamble that won't pay off. Our economics editor Paul Mason's with me now. Paul, um, what are the new fiscal targets then? Well, here's 18 pages of the Chancellor's Mace lecture, and there aren't any new fiscal rules in there. Um, we'll have to wait for the pre-budget report for that. But I think it's safe to say after tonight that the old fiscal rules are toast. Let's get them up on screen to just remind ourselves for old Lang Syne what they were. The national debt uh, can't go uh, above 40% of GDP. That was one rule. And the other one was that over the cycle, you have to borrow to invest, not to spend on current spending. Now, the reason these rules have been broken is because they're all are gone because they're already broken. And the Chancellor's new attitude is that you will, we, he will borrow more to meet the challenges of the coming recession. That means above 40% and probably borrowing to spend on things we need right now. Is there um, a credibility problem here? Well, the Chancellor's critics say there is because before, even before the banking meltdown and collapse of September, October 08, they were pushing the boundaries of these rules for fairly normal and, and uh, uh, cyclical reasons. And certainly the experts in, in, in fiscal policy uh, were, have been critical about this lecture tonight. What was missing in the middle was an admission that the uh, fiscal rules had been essentially losing credibility over recent years before the crisis erupted. And I think that unless the government learns the lessons of that period, then it's unlikely to be able to put in place a new framework that people will have more confidence in than they ended up having in the old framework. In terms of what's actually happened here tonight, uh, the US Fed has cut interest rates. Is it likely that we'll follow suit here? Well, the Federal Reserve's cut interest rates by half of a percent, down to one percent. And at the same time, so has China's central bank. Now, that leaves the Fed with not many more weapons to fire, but it's a big cut, and it shows the pressure the Bank of England's under. The Chancellor today uh, mounted a staunch defence of the British system, but you know, you've now got, uh, this wasn't a coordinated rate cut. The question is, is the Bank of England going to join in? And if it is, what is its explanation as to why it's doing it? The Chancellor pointed out that the Bank of England has flexibility as regards to the interest rate target, as to the amount of time it takes to get interest rates to 2%. But it leaves Mervyn King having to explain, well, um, I've cut rates in an emergency way, maybe tomorrow, because in 18 months' time I see an inflation target slightly out. It, it, it stretches the credibility of the Bank of England's rules, so much so that one member of the MPC yet again tonight comes out and says, monetary policy is behind the curve. OK, Paul Mason, thanks a lot. Coming up here on the programme... The online revolution driven by acre after acre of unseen computer servers, but at what cost to the environment? First, a roundup of today's news. Our main story tonight, Russell Brand has resigned from the BBC for offending the actor Andrew Sachs with lewd messages left on his answer phone during a radio show. His co-presenter, Jonathan Ross, has also apologised. Ross has been suspended from the corporation Penny and Inquiry, but reports suggest he's still receiving £16,000 a day. In other news, in a rare and expensive move, Barack Obama will become the first presidential candidate in 16 years to air a 30-minute primetime infomercial on US TV networks. Earlier, I spoke to Peter Marshall, who's in Florida, and I asked him what the advert's all about. Well, it's an unprecedented pitch from Barack Obama, 30 minutes of prime time across four major networks. Some of it will be live. He's broadcasting from a rally here in Florida. A lot of it's recorded, so there's going to be lots of violins, suburban lawns, Americana and flags billowing. He'll be around a breakfast table talking to four 
working class families about their lives and problems, saying how a president can profoundly affect history and their lives, either for good or ill. He'll say the last year has been, last eight years has been for ill. He'll also discuss his own life experience. For example, his mother's struggle with breast cancer at the, in her early 50s and how she died wrangling with a health insurance company. And he'll say how that, for example, has made him realize the need for fundamental change in healthcare provision in America. 30 minutes of, uh, of ad, though, isn't there a danger of overkill? Well, Obama's senior advertising man has said, well, the public can always watch one of the 150 other cable channels available, or they can put a video game on, he said. The New York Times points out that Obama's already taken out advertising space in an awful lot of video games. John McCain, not surprisingly, has said Obama's being presumptuous by taking out these, this 30-minute slot. Uh, uh, McCain is actually in Florida as well today. He's been discussing national security here, plugging that. Uh, he said that he'll never take out advertising, which delays is the start of a World Series game. The World Series is showing directly after Obama's broadcast. Uh, what about the cash involved here, Peter? Do we know how much the ad's actually costing? Well, the ads cost over $3 million to make and the same to put it on TV. But one thing the Obama campaign has plenty of is cash. Over $650 million they've raised. Now, that's come, they pride themselves on saying, from small donations, no more than $2,000 uh, per donor. However, there's an embarrassing story for the Democrats on Politico magazine, from Politico magazine today, uh, suggesting that wealthy donors have contributed money for access to Obama's advisors. Apparently $28,000 gives you an audience with Warren Buffett on economics. $10,000 gives you access to Joe Biden, Barack Obama's running mate. Peter Marshall there in Florida for us. In other news, a woman with multiple sclerosis has failed to persuade the High Court challenge that it should clarify the law on assisted suicide in England and Wales. Debbie Purdy had wanted to know whether her husband would be prosecuted if he helped her to go abroad to kill herself. She says she'll appeal. Rescuers in Pakistan are carrying out a desperate search for survivors after a powerful earthquake killed at least 170 people in the southwest of the country. Supplies are being brought in for the thousands left homeless, although aftershocks and blocked roads have hampered aid operations. Let's take you to uh, the markets at the end of the day. Then FTSE 100 share index closed 316 points higher. In New York, the Dow Jones fell some 74 points. Only the third time in October that the blue chips had just a double-digit close. A short time ago, against the euro, the pound was slightly up. Against the dollar, the pound also up. Next time you send a text or do a quick web search, spare a thought for the planet. Each new gadget, like the phone out tomorrow that runs Google's Android mobile software, has a hidden cost. Our increasingly online lifestyles, driven by giant computers or servers, locked away in faraway warehouses. They all need energy to keep them going and energy to cool them down. Generating that energy means, of course, carbon emissions. In fact, the latest figures say that by 2020, emissions from these computer servers will match emissions from the airline industry. Our science editor, Susan Watts, stars some of the biggest names in the business, what they're going to do about it. Today's world moves on data, and we access that data using ever smaller, ever more efficient devices. I need the GPS capability. To surf the web portably, it has email that I can check whenever I want. It allows us to keep tabs on our Google Reader. Oh, I'm really excited about quicker web browser access. But these are just the front end of the internet. And this is the back end of the internet, rack upon rack of computers called servers. They don't call these places server farms for nothing, they're huge. When this one was installed, it was the largest in the world. Now it's just typical. We've come to IBM's Silicon Valley Research Center in California to talk to Dr. Chu. He's a 35-year veteran of computer networks. Since 1980, uh, we have created this data center, which is the size of three football fields, mm -hmm. about 40,000 square feet, with 10,000 uh, servers. But when it was first created, um, it was the largest data center in the world. He thinks people simply haven't made the connection between what they do every day online and the power they're using. 
Every time you send an instant message to your friend, you're using energy, not only from your device, but also through the network, to the servers, to the mainframe computers, and then out back out to your friend who could be thousands of miles away. Just after IBM built its giant server farm, a group of computer scientists down the road in Stanford formed a startup to cash in on the growth in computer networking, specializing in the technologies behind today's internet. At the height of the dot-com boom, Cisco was briefly the world's most valuable company, and it's big enough today to have its own tram stop. And a reception straight out of the Wizard of Oz. Hello there. Hi. Hi, I've come to see Paul. Paul Marku? Sure, he's already in the telepresence room in Barcadero. Thank you. He's vice president of green engineering, so keen to show off one of the ways the company cuts emissions. Hello, Paul. Hello, Susan. Hi there. Well, this is the Cisco telepresence room. What it does is essentially it diminishes the need for us to have air travel. And as you can see from the, the room itself, it's, uh, it's augmented to make it look like we are in the same room. Normally, you'd use telepresence to talk across continents. In this case, Paul was just next door, so could show me around one of Cisco's laboratories, where Web 2.0, the next generation internet, is being developed. This is a 21st century manufacturing. This is our laboratory. This is one of about 1,500 that are within the Cisco organization. What would happen if I pulled out one of these wires? You could probably shut off somebody here or shut an engineer off in China or shut somebody down, uh, a research person in India. The cooling here is critical. Temperatures would skyrocket from the normal 60 degrees Fahrenheit without it. If there's a, an error on the air conditioning system, it will reach 120 degrees in here within two or three minutes. That's pretty scary, isn't it? Very scary. You could actually feel the heat coming off some of these machines. Oh, yes. Well, oh, yes. In fact, the industry is so energy hungry, it's already being compared to the airline business. But this industry says it's getting to grips with the problem earlier. To use the argument that, well, you can't redesign an engine quickly, well, you can redesign an engine as you can redesign a microprocessor. They both take about the same hundreds of millions of dollars. They take thousands of engineers globally to do it. So they, even though one is a chip and one's an engine, um, they both require a huge amount of effort. But they'll have to move fast. The latest official estimates say that by 2020, the world's computer servers will match the carbon emissions of the airline industry. And astonishingly, they already match the emissions given out by the car manufacturing industry. The body set up to green the industry decided they had to sort out the problem, but not out of eco-concern. We did a survey in the green grid of a number of our uh, members and their IT organizations, and we found that there was a, a, a large number of people that became very concerned about power when they brought a new rack of servers in, and there was no more power to be had. I mean, they maxed out the power that they could bring. But a lot of companies still insist on putting their data centers where they've built them historically, even though there's no energy. In the old days, IT needed to be very close to the business, the stock exchange or the trading departments of large banks. But except for a very small number of applications, that is no longer the case. We can have data centers hundreds of miles away with very fast fiber links that provide most of the IT services that most organizations need. So there's no real reason to put data centers in the center of London. One plan called Follow the Moon is for companies to shift their active data centers around the globe to seek out cheap, abundant energy. They move through the network their entire operations to areas to where it's always nighttime. The reason for that is because the local utilities have a very different cost model for their energy and it's also not only less expensive but it's also more important to maintain a certain level of efficiency for the utility. And so by moving these loads strategically around the planet, you save energy. So where would you go? One solution is to come to a place like this, 
Until two years ago, this was the NATO air base that protected the Arctic Circle. Now this inhospitable peninsula of Iceland is seen as the perfect place to build a server farm. And that's partly because, well, it's really cold. Vern Global bought these two sheds from the US Navy and they have plenty of space as well as free cold air so customers, once they get some, don't have to buy energy to cool their servers. So this is just one of the areas that you could use then, is that right? Yeah, actually this is just one sixth of what we currently have on our, on our premises and we have an option to scale up so this could be one of the 15. So we have 15 times more than you see. Apart from the cold, the other reason that Iceland is so attractive for power-hungry server farms is its massive reserves of renewable energy. There aren't many countries so proud of their hydroelectric schemes that they get local artists to decorate them. This one sits at the bottom of the most important hydro river system in Iceland. Two or three projects like this is the equivalent of an average-sized nuclear power station. The multi-millionaire behind the plan to lure the world's data centres here says businesses are planning for a world where carbon costs. It's all an economic uh, equation at the end of the day. And certainly people can see that the uh, more regulation coming online in terms of carbon emissions and etc. And by the year 2020, data centres will be a bigger carbon emitter than the airline industry. And, uh, Taking that in, uh, in, in, in consideration, for sure they are uh, applying the economic uh, consequences of that. Iceland's plan to host the world's servers may be ambitious, but then this is the nation that turned an ugly geothermal power plant into the world famous Blue Lagoon Spa. So they don't lack the will, but what they do lack is the hardware, the fibre optic links needed to send data to and fro. So if you can't move your service to Iceland straight away, what can you do now? One problem is that computing power is cheap, so companies buy a new box for each new task rather than reprogramming the computers they have to do more. Software called Virtualization fixes this by making each server run several tasks. This harks back to when companies had one mainframe computer doing everything. Well, actually, what, what's happening is that you are now beginning to centralize the data centers uh, so that in the data center, you can have, like in here, you have 10,000 servers. And then within the 10,000 servers, you can run many workloads and you can share more efficiently using virtualization, uh, which is one of the you know, big green uh, initiatives that IBM has undertaken. So with IBM aiming for a switch from big blue to big green, what's happening at the company that's arguably synonymous with the internet generation? We went to their Mountain View headquarters to try to find out. Google is well known for its commitment to all things green. Here on the Google campus, there's a bike share system with free bikes outside every building so the Googlers who work here can get around. The security guards here drive in electric carts and there's a carpool scheme with plug-in hybrid vehicles for anyone who wants to borrow one. Oh, and by the way, the electricity to recharge these cars comes from solar panels mounted on the roof here. But is all this just PR bluster? A sop to consumers who are beginning to demand that their computing providers think green. Google's green czar appeared defensive. All of the IT equipment in the world, or information and communications technology in the world, consumes on the order of 2% of the world's electricity. That compares though to say the car manufacturing industry or you know within a few years to the level of emissions you might get from the airline industry. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a small percentage but you know lots of small percentages would, could make a difference. Right and I think if the IT industry um, does not work over the next 5, 10, 15 years to continue to make the equipment much more energy efficient to look for greener sources of energy to power it um, that there could well be a major problem. 
Google says it is tackling the emissions problem by seeking new sources of renewable energy, but they're spending only a few tens of millions of dollars. And it turns out they've developed their own version of virtualization software to pursue greener computing, but they've decided to keep that secret. We have a competitive advantage, we believe, over our major competition that we don't want to just give them. And that's a trade-off that any um, business that's in business uh, has to make. And Google has a plan to swallow and digest the world's data. That's going to take a lot of servers. Just how many, we don't know. We weren't allowed anywhere near their data centers to film. And they were coy about giving us numbers in case their competitors found out. Google's latest mission statement is to organize the world's information, making it universally usable and accessible. What that means is all your information on its computers. How much energy will that take to run? In Gartner, we've tried to approach Google to get some information about how green they are. We haven't had a lot of luck. Um, they, they present a very good story externally, but I have no metrics or no information that I can use to quantify exactly how good they are compared to any other organization, a bank or even a government office. So I'm afraid we really don't know how good they are. Great marketing, though. Google isn't a member of Green Grid, the industry body, but then perhaps that doesn't matter so much. Even Green Grid's efficiency drives might actually be more about selling boxes. I personally believe there's only three reasons people do things. One is to make money, the other is to save money, and the third is government regulation. I mean, at the end of the day, that's why businesses do anything. And, uh, but I think what the Green Grid is doing today is working with uh, the uh, government to try to develop the standards and the programs so that they can be effective. And perhaps he's given the game away there. True, all these efficiencies save money and cut carbon emissions, but it may actually be fear that's driving the companies that make servers. Fear that if they don't make these changes on their terms, the government will do it for them. After all, if we go on demanding faster access to more data online, building power stations to cope, and aim to keep emissions at bay, something's got to give. Sounds to Susan Watt with that report. Let's just take you through the front pages of uh, tomorrow's papers, uh, all dominated, as you can probably imagine, uh, by the same story. The joke is on us, as the Express. Jonathan Ross suspended, so now he gets £16,000 a day of taxpayers' money for doing absolutely nothing. The Day of Reckoning has uh, Ross and Brand there. They'll discover today whether his obscene phone call will cost, uh, will cost him his £18 million deal. Uh, this is what they call the Day of Reckoning for Jonathan Ross. Uh, on The Independent, they've taken the other side, Manuel's Revenge, the actor Andrew Sachs, and they're saying the future of the most senior woman in British radio is in doubt. And The Telegraph, uh, don't think we have. Let's show you The Guardian here. Brand quits, Ross hangs on as BBC tries to contain a firestorm. Executives fret about the possible impact on the BBC's future. That's all from Newsnight tonight, but I'll be back with more tomorrow. Until then, good night. Good evening. Wherever you start the day on Thursday, it's going to be on the cold side. And for some of you, there's the additional factor of seeing some real, particularly so.